Hello and welcome to the workshop on equity, diversity and inclusion. ISAN's organizational and program-based approaches. We are five colleagues from ISAN's Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia. And we're all glad to have you here, although we cannot see you. Um, at ISANS, we live and work in Mi'kma'ki, the land of the Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge that we're on unceded traditional Mi'kmaq territory. We're grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. And as we work to settle newcomers to Nova Scotia, we honor and respect the indigenous people of this land. We're all treaty people. As you will know from participating in this conference, we'd like you to please put questions on Slido. If you open the Slido app and put in the conference code, you can find the workshop names and select this one, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. We welcome you to start putting your questions as the speakers are presenting so that when all four presentations are done, we can begin responding to the questions. Um, I'd also encourage you to support other questions so that we know what most people are interested in and we will take the questions with the most votes first. So my name is Nabiha Atala. I am the moderator for this session. And my four colleagues who will be presenting are Venka Gustal, Paul Pickering, Sharida Hassanali, and Maria Kane. As each person presents, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So we'll begin with Venka and ISAN's EDI strategy. Hello, everybody. My name is Venka Gostal, and I am um, the director of programs at ISANS. Uh, and I am um, a white immigrant woman that came to Nova Scotia for 30 some years ago. Uh, and I've spent the last 24 years or so with ISANS, uh, with the majority of the time uh, working frontline and with community partners. Um, and I would like to spend the next 15 minutes or so to talk to, to you about our equity, diversity, inclusion journey as a settlement agency and why we are doing it and the experiences of so far and where we are headed. So we are a multi-service agency at ISANS, one-stop shop settlement agency, uh, providing services for, uh, from pre-arrival services, a settlement, wrap, language, employment, and partner and community employment engagement. Uh, we also are a sponsorship agreement holder. Um, and over the last 40 uh, years, um, like we have, a, 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 we just celebrated our 40 year anniversary. So we have a, um, a long history of serving immigrants of different back backgrounds and circumstances. Currently, we have a staff team of about 270 uh, some staff and again, uh, from, from very um, diverse uh, um, and broad background. Our vision is a community where all can belong and grow. And our mission is helping immigrants build a future in Nova Scotia. Um, and as a settlement agencies, we also provide services in a province with the oldest African Canadian population and their rich history. And we live and work in the land of the Mi'kmaq people that Nabiha was uh, referring to and also in the place where the Acadian population settled and were expelled from. So I believe many of, of uh, so really uh, the context of our strategy is, is grounded in, in that history, both of our work and uh, the promise that we are in. I believe many of you listening in, in from other settlement agencies can may possibly relate to some of the story uh, and the journey that we have been on. So over the last 40 years as an organization, we have seen how staff, clients and immigrant communities have been treated uh, badly in different, base, uh, in different ways based on their race, ethnicity, gender, age, religion, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity and ability and the intersectionality of these factors. It has shown up uh, as racism, discrimination, homophobia, microaggression or unconscious bias between staff, between clients, by clients and staff, by service providers, 
and we see it in we have seen it in, in policies and processes and who have access what and who is not included so in in, in the different ways of, as we have been serving clients in the community and also obviously and i've seen it uh, with the experience of, of staff we also seen how it impacted access to services employment such as employment uh, related to health and other uh, related inequities. So uh, we have worked on these issues with staff and in our, in our programs and services. Um, we have also shared knowledge, information, experiences about issues, laws, and the rights to, to our newcomers. Uh, we have also looked at how to enhance services to address these issues that we are seeing and work to provide a voice for people with lived experiences and make sure that they are part of um, um, to address the, the issues that we are seeing. Uh, and we, in many different ways over the years, have been addressing systemic barriers, engage in advocacy, uh, different committees locally, provincially, and nationally, been part of consultations, and seek funding to run projects to address issues um, that we are facing or that we have been seeing. We also worked on internal policies and processes and services. Um, and, and offering training to staff and to community. So while we have seen progress and improvements, there has also been times where we have felt discouraged and I felt we see, see little result of the time and effort we have put in addressing these issues and advocacy. So we came to a point that we felt we needed to approach this differently uh, than, than how we have done so far. Um, So in 2017, um, we launched our current strategic plan where there, where there is four pillars, empowering immigrants, value and supporting staff, engaging partners and community, and a champion a more welcome and inclusive province. The key things we heard in this consultation was that we need to develop one organizational empowerment approach to service and to, uh, to services and to staff uh, and operations including how it relates to EDI, and more intentionally collaborate with partners to address systemic inequities and attitudes. It's not that we didn't do these things before, and we have, had a, lot, we have a lot of history with working with many different partners, but we felt we needed to have more intentionally, intentional collaborations with partners and more strategically uh, be doing this in a, and trying to do it in a different way to see if it has more impact and continue to build spaces for first voices and lived experiences. And this strategic plan is strate uh, strategically set us on the path to put EDI as a strategic organizational pr priority and allowing us to look deeper at, the ro at our roles uh, as we that we have personally and professionally in the organization um, and, uh, and individually. So the focus, um, the focus of the work that we have done since 2017 um, has, has been that we had looked at the HR team that was changed to people and culture in order to expand it, its scope, scope and services. There was again uh, some of the things that we uh, discovered in the discussions through the strategic plan, the areas that we, need, we wanted to work on. We also, uh, were, we also uh, put the internal EDI work uh, under people and culture. So it had a, a specific home and a focus. We consulted with staff and gave our staff, uh, um, consulted with staff and also did uh, an internal survey about their experiences, uh, experiences and suggestions. And, and this resulted in an action plan. We also created new committees and renamed some to try to, again, to have a further focus on the EDI's um, commitment that we had set. So we created the EDI committee um, that uh, before was a, a working group sp uh, specifically on anti-racism and reported, uh, which this new EDI now, uh, EDI committee is now reporting to the senior leadership team. We also, um, the, re the reconciliation working group uh, it was also created and was a uh, an opportunity of sharing of knowledge on indigenous issues amongst us. Uh, and we also, um, because it was a very a strong commitment to work on uh, one way of providing services across the organization to try to have one approach, uh, we created a service delivery working group. And initially the focus was uh, using the word empowerment, but really what it is is anti-oppressive practice. 
and also uh, we uh, we also have uh, the intercultural program working group that many of uh, the couple of the members on the board or, or, or of this panel is part of, uh, on and that are focusing on our external EDI services. So and and also since 2017, we have conducted scans and assessment where we looked at experiences and issues of different groups of staff and clients and their experiences both within our organization and in the and in the program services we provide and in the community. We did, um, so we have looked at, we done needs assessments around our seniors, uh, immigrants, our uh, clients with disability, our LGBTQ2 plus community, uh, both clients and, and within our staff team. And as well as um, also um, looked at um, our, uh, the experience of racialized staff as well. Um, we also have, um, since 2007, really tr 17, tried to uh, gather staff on a yearly basis and for one day and have a really focused um, conversation and sharing opportunity. And the last three years have been focusing on uh, uh, diversity, uh, EDI um, uh, topics, uh, including one of the one of the days we had um, an elder from the Mi'kmaq community to share with us, uh, so we could have some reflections around uh, as a settlement agency and also as a settler, and also uh, learning about the rich history and culture, and and looking at ways to how to explore uh, a relationship uh, building within that community. It also allowed opportunity for us to do um, to go into groups and have further discussions about what are we learning from the day and where are we moving forward with that learning. And we have done that the same with the other EDI um, uh, sessions that we have had a uh, full day for the whole organization. Um, the other area that we also have focused on, focused on is supporting staff and that can be recognizing that um, people can experience um, that there are different incidences and situations that can really trigger people in different ways. And uh, we have had sit unfortunate situations over the last two, three years that really showed us that we need to uh, provide a, a safe and, and uh, a responsive uh, way to support our client, uh, our staff and also clients uh, when something happened. So, um, it, with uh, so if for a while ago when there were uh, the shootings, uh, shooting situation in a, um, in a in a mosque, we we uh, then were were reaching out to our to our staff and clients and provide us to see what we what support we can do. Um, recently, we have had a group a, a, a group uh, support like a group. Um, uh, debriefing, uh, debriefing groups for for, for staff um, when we had had uh, a recent um, uh, a shooting, a mass shooting in Nova Scotia, but also we had the fire of where we lost um, uh, uh, children, uh, uh, children uh, uh, to, uh, to a fire. So looking at how, and as, re and as well recently with the shootings in, in the States, the impact on staff and on clients and looking at a way how we can support that. So, so we really try to address uh, how we should um, address the trauma and the triggers uh, that, that people are feeling and being there when, when there are times of vulnerability and where they fe possibly feeling targeted or depending on the situation. The, um, in relation to programs and services, uh, what we also have had looked at is that uh, we have looked at uh, done projects, pilots, and program enhancements, so we can do, so we can better respond to current needs and potential gaps uh, that we have seen related to this, and as well have looked at improving tools and resources and approaches that increases the capacity of organizations, employers, and volunteers to support immigrant integration. In relation to community and partners, we have worked on strengthening and building strategic partnerships and relationships and enhanced the public dialogue on immigration through a proactive communication strategy that includes research and storytelling. And also addressing policies and processes that are, bar that are barriers to our clients and collaborate with others to address systemic issues facing immigrants. So we are, in all of these things that I mentioned now, we have just tried to be a little bit more 
proactive, uh, more strategic, and more uh, trying to set up um, supports so we are better able to, um, to, ad to address these areas. This is a very busy chart, and I don't expect you to maybe see, um, to go into study all parts of it, but it really shows, this is really the work that we have done since 2017. And in, in last year, we just finished this spring, we have done a, a bit of a review of all these different smaller scans that we have, we have conducted, uh, reviewed a bit of the committees that we have been on, the different programming that we have developed and enhanced, the training that we have delivered and, um, and, and piloted. There have been different documents, EA, EAL initiatives that we have done as well of uh, things we have done operationally. So we used the opportunity this year uh, over the last year to look at all of those things and come up with key learnings and recommendations from all these, these to see, uh, to try to narrow down what are our biggest priorities over the next little while. And also the other thing we did is that we used the opportunity um, to create um, eight, uh, eight, um, eight self-directed sessions and four full day sessions on EDI from a broad, broader EDI perspective and with a lens of intersectionality, social justice and human rights. And it looks like I have two minutes left. So, um, So the key recommendations that we are looking at right now are the organizational strategy and action plan. We are looking at our training and particularly with the new EDI training inter internally that we have for our staff. We are looking at operational, so further work to enhance policies and guidelines that have come out of these recommendations that we have got and building key partnership and supports and expectations and through people and culture uh, looking to for funding to uh, hire an internal EDI consultant that can help us both to do the training and to do enhancement of the work that we are doing. And uh, again, with client su uh, support, uh, explore new opportunities to further address systemic issues and a service delivery where clients engage, engagement is further advanced. So this is the next steps that I just briefly introduced, but because I had probably one minute left, I just want to go quickly into reflections. So, so looking back at our journey, and I know this was a very quick, very high level, quick overview of what we have done, is that our work and approach will continue to evolve and will remain constantly at the forefront of our work. So this EDI work and the commitment to that, we believe that um, it affects everything we do um, and the importance to understand power and privilege and how that shows up and be used. So our role in, in every individual staff and as an organization and as partners that we partner with, what is the roles and, the, and, the, and how do we use this, the, the, the space we have to, 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 to advance the issues that we're looking at. And the importance of all of us to be vulnerable, reflective and provide safer space for other voices and be open for the life learning, lifelong learning that this is putting us on and to be ready for difficult conversations um, and, uh, and to be aware of the unintentional impact of what we do or say. We also have been building on, uh, believe building an organizational approach across the organization is important, but challenging. So it has been challenging to work on this with 270 some uh, staff in different teams and, and uh, but I feel it is very, uh, with, with many people with very different perspectives and, and experiences, but we see that there's a need to, to do that because we need to be, um, we need to be involved, we need to consult and engage everybody so we, everybody is on board as we're moving forward. Um, and while it takes more time doing it that way, it, it's a very important uh, step to include. And, um, and also the importance of dedicated staffing resources and the struggles when we don't have that. Most of this work has been done on the side of um, the desk in a way. And uh, when, when we, we, so it has been difficult to prioritize full time. This to, and that's why I think also uh, why we, we are where we are. And also that we, being aware that during this journey, situations happens and we need to respond to all, all of those in a very um, in a very caring and supportive way, 
and use those uh, oppor those as opportunities to um, to support um, uh, to, to you know to learn and support and reflect. Um, and I also believe that we are not able to do this alone. And um, we have been very thankful for um, all the partnerships and, and engagement with people in the settlement sector, organizations in the settlement sector on um, addressing the different um, issues that we have seen that we need to, uh, that we have put um, to try to, to address, you know, the barriers uh, and the obstacles that, um, that we are seeing. And, um, and, and also that there is a lot of expertise in the sector that we have been really um, fortunate to learn from and to, to build on. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Venka. We'll, we'll move to Paul next. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Pickering. I am the Workplace Culture Program Coordinator and uh, we'll have an overview of this program today. I've been in this role uh, since 2013, and I immigrated to Canada in 2011. So the program itself, we have, uh, this is an employer facing program. Uh, we're looking to help employers and organizations in general, uh, and then anybody who works for them. So the employees side, uh, we're looking for an improved ability to hire, retain and promote Im immigrant employees. We're looking for an increased understanding of the benefits of international experience and intercultural skills and greater intercultural competence and skills in leadership and across all staff. Okay, so what we are, well, this is intercultural employer development. Uh, we focus on the intercultural side of things. There's a whole program below that, and we'll come to that in just a moment, but the intercultural side of things, it is for any employer, any organization within Nova Scotia. Uh, we go across Nova Scotia. We have uh, deliveries everywhere from Amherst to Sydney to Yarmouth, uh, large and small towns, locations, employers, uh, public sector, private sector, uh, anybody you can mention really. We'll see a slide later on about that and on-site and online. And especially in the past 10 months, we've gotten a whole lot better at the on-site side of things, as you probably would expect. Uh, but um, we're hoping that at some point we can go back on-site again. But that online side, uh, we're doing a whole lot more with that. And uh, okay. So there's a whole lot below the surface of what we're doing. Uh, we have an equity, diversity, inclusion, wellness, and anti-racism foundation. So we're really looking at everything that we do has the EDI lens, as well as the lens that says, we need to be aware of what makes a, a, a positive supportive workplace. And more recently, because of events, we've said we, we need, really need to say what is anti-racism as well? And how do we help employers really take a stand in this, in this sphere? So whatever we're doing has these aspects embedded in every conversation and every activity. Uh, we're aware that these, these ideas, these, uh, these background pieces really do play a role. We're also aware of immigration past, present and future. We make the point that over the years, Nova Scotia and Canada in general, this is an immigrant nation and uh, we have an inheritance from that. We have a legacy. We have, uh, we have a whole lot of things to be aware of. And to put it into perspective, everybody in this virtual room today uh, is connected, whether we're indigenous, in which case we were totally impacted by by immigration, by the settlers, or our ancestors came from other places. We're talking about everybody. We're talking about everybody in the province and how we relate to each other with that past, present, and future perspective. When I mentioned legacy and inheritance, we're also talking about Nova Scotian and Canadian history. So on a regular basis, we do actually have conversations that include uh, indigeneity. We have conversations that say, well, what about the African Nova Scotian piece? And that is part of what, what these conversations um, generate. We don't come in with that focus, but it's in the room anyway, and it does come up. So we have a responsibility to allow that space to be safe, to encourage that space to be safe. In this context, we also say there are multicultural business opportunities. Simply, simply put, we're better at doing our jobs when we're engaging with a multicultural perspective. And the intercultural side is those coming from other cultures. Okay. 
whether it's from Lebanon, whether it's from Israel, whether it's from Ghana or Vietnam or Russia, we're all coming from a different place, ultimately. What are those pieces that we're, that we're engaging with? What are those pieces that, that manifest in the workplace? And the final framework piece is saying that we can get better at many, many aspects of this with intercultural competencies. There are focuses here that we can get better at. There's skill sets we can get better at. Okay, there's a pathway. Uh, employers are, enc are encouraged to go as far as they wish to go, to go as far into this and deepen the, into this as it makes sense for them. We certainly are looking at engagement initial questions. Uh, we encourage employers to to um, book book the program for presentations. We have monthly webinars. Once those are in place, we say, wouldn't you like to see a workshop or have a discussion group on these topics? And for those employers who are actually saying, let's look at how we're going to change our culture. Let's look at how we're really going to get into this in some depth. Well, we have assessment tools. We're going to get to those in a moment. Uh, and out of those assessment tools come action plans and change. And hopefully, through the process, we have an employer who says, let's look at what we've done. Let's recognize how we've benefited and let's grow accordingly. And, uh, and that, that does happen. We have a range of employers who've gone through that whole process and have said, wow, there's some really good work that's come from this. Okay, so the program itself, what we offer, well, the presentations, there are three different presentations. Uh, one is like what we're doing at this very moment, which is simply a program overview. We've also got a presentation that we call Intercultural Competence 101. It reviews, it overviews, it kind of manifests a variety of major topics, major ideas, and says, here's what the landscape looks like. We also have a more specific presentation that says, let's look at some barriers, hiring and retention. We look at pre-interview, interview, post-interview. Post what are these barriers to hiring and retention as a just a presentation? We also have monthly live stream webinars. We call them live stream because it's me talking. It's not pre-recorded. I'm there. I'm full access to anybody on the webinar who says I've got a question or at various points I stop. We stop and say, what do you think? What's working for you? Is this making sense? Are you on board with this? Where are you? So these are live stream. They're interactive. They are PowerPoint led, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a possibility for anybody to say, I'm just curious and I'd like a chance to engage with this. It's not simply a pre-recorded session. Uh, the first one is for all staff. It's for anybody. It's a great entry point. The second one is based on our assessment tool and it's really good for managers and directors. Okay, those discussion sessions I mentioned. So these are much more loosely structured. Uh, they've got some cute abbreviations, acronyms there, uh, but they're simply a way to refer with sometimes without getting over, without uh, having to use all the words all the time. Um, but workplace culture and immigrant newcomers, we're really looking at that starting point for a discussion. People will have had a webinar, they will have had a chance to get their heads into it a little bit, and they've got a, an opportunity to say, let's talk about this a bit more amongst our staff or with sometimes a variety of employers in the room that overcoming barriers to hiring and retention, well, that's an opportunity to look more in depth at that, at that HR piece. Uh, there's a bit more focus in the next one with COVID-19 and where employers might be going. Uh, we've got a senior leadership focus with intercultural competencies and organizational planning. And we ask that anybody who's doing a discussion session actually have done those prerequisites first, those, those webinars, okay? Okay. Workshops, workshops on site and online. So the on the online part, well, most of them are kind of are mostly there. We're still working on some aspects, but as soon as somebody says, "Hey, let's do," for example, making your workplace welcoming, if it's not quite ready, we'll get it ready for the date. Uh, but those are the pieces we've had in place for quite a long time. Uh, a lot of employers have engaged with these workshops, and uh, we've had some some success already with the online versions. The first two, again, that's that piece for all staff. For all staff, the next two, that's again those that opportunity for managers and directors to say, let's let's look at this a bit more in depth and have a focus for our team. Okay, workplace culture assessments, personal, individual, and organizational. Okay, this is not a sit down at your desk and do a fifteen minute assessment. Uh, we do this with focus groups, and we do this with the organization. 
so we and they they very much work together on these that we, 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 we build the uh, we build the next steps from an assessment based on what those first responses are and we work this, the focus group input with the managerial input. The assessments themselves, as we say, focus group, individual focus, uh, it's about a 45 minute piece. Uh, the results are anonymized and we're looking for organizational input. The organizational side, we're looking for key decision makers in the room it's about 90 minutes to complete and debrief. Uh, I would sit with the group and, and go through with any questions and comments, and certainly then for, then for the debrief. Uh, we're looking for some key organizational development areas. Uh, and again, that shows up in that leveraging uh, your workplace culture webinar, those key areas. And we're looking to pro provide a foundation for actions, priorities, timelines, and outcomes. Okay. Okay, so we've had a variety of employer partners. Uh, this is just over the past year, uh, just a sample. And it's really just intended to show that we've got a wide variety of organizations that have engaged with us uh, across the province. And um, we've got uh, organizational departments, we've got small organizations, big organizations, and uh, there's really no, uh, there's no pattern quite often. It's just, we might get a, we might get a, uh, a call from a large insurer one day and a very small care facility the next day. Quick case study, uh, Dalhousie University Facilities Management. We had a range of discussion sessions over the over two years and they were the first ones that engaged us with, with discussion sessions. They said, they said, okay, thank you to be here, two minutes. Uh, they said, we, we've, we've done this, we've done the workshops and we'd like to do a bit more. So what can you do? And with these discussion sessions, we simply sat and talked with a staff. And uh, as we can see, there were a range of really interesting and exciting outcomes that came from a dedicated range of discussion sessions. Okay. It was simply an upskilling of staff understanding of what immigration is about, what refugees are about, and how intercultural situations can play out and be resolved within the workplace. And facilities management, um, last I knew, they had about 65% international born on their staff of about 210. So a very, very wide, diverse staff as far as experience. A couple pieces on organizational impacts. Just a quick look at this. We've all been through this. We've all had this experience. And if you look at some of these things that are listed, it all most of it looks kind of familiar, but some of those pieces on the right-hand column, the flattening of the hierarchy, the role of kindness, compassion, looking at systemic bias and such, addressing, addressing biases. These are things that are, that are kind of starting up in a way that's a little bit surprising. And it's also, manifesting in a way that is really shifting how we see organizations, okay? And how organizations respond to unexpected big events. The second piece is the personal impacts. And as we look at the personal impacts, again, this all is gonna look familiar, but it's also gonna be saying, right, what do we do with this as an organization? And if you look at that piece right in the middle on the, on the left side, mental and physical health challenges, family violence, trauma, rebalancing priorities, I'm not for a second suggesting employers should ask about these things, but employers need to be aware that these are going on regardless and employers are shifting their cultures to be that much more aware and engaging, knowing what's going on at home, okay. We have a wide variety, of re wide variety of resources. These are just a very, very few. Uh, anybody, any employer who says, hey, can you recommend a video? Can you recommend uh, a newspaper, newspaper story about what you're doing, about what's going on? We've got Mayor Savage here um, doing a really, really nice piece. We've got Chimamanda Aditya, who's got a, a fabulous TED Talk, Dangerous Single Story. We've got newspaper articles about biases and blind spots. There's a whole wide variety of resources that we draw from and we're happy to share. And that'll be it. And I think I'm pretty close to, uh, to my allotment. So I will look forward to your, to your questions uh, and any answers I can provide, I'm more than happy to. And if you're interested in this program, please do reach out. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sherry Hassanali. I'm coming to you from Shabuktuk in Mi'kma'ki. 
also known as Halifax, Nova Scotia. I am the coordinator of community capacity and I have been in this role at ISANS since January of 2020, so just this year. Um, I have had that as part of my role. I have the great privilege of facilitating the Welcome Ambassador Program. Nabiha has very kindly taken, um, has done the land acknowledgement for us. But I will say this, um, as part of what I do um, in this work, these workshops that I give, um, I always say that I believe that no matter how long we settlers have been here, because we are all settlers, whether it's 400 years or 400 minutes, the indigenous peoples of this land will always be our hosts and we will always be their guests. So we are absolutely grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. ISANS believes that the arrival of new Nova Scotians affords us all the opportunity I'll turn that off so I can actually see my screen there, affords us the opportunity to explore in more detail the possibilities of establishing communities that are inclusive, diverse, and welcoming. So let me tell you a little bit about the Welcome Ambassador Program. So in 2015, the Government of Canada made a commitment to resettle 25,000 Syrian refugees. And similar to other jurisdictions, Nova Scotia saw a surge in newcomers arriving from Syria. So community groups, sponsorship groups, social services providers, and government um, representatives were exploring ways in which to respond to their arrival. Now, I need to say this, that Nova Scotia has had a very long and difficult history with racism and colonialism. And we were extremely concerned about the safety and potential non-welcoming climate that these newcomers might face. That said, in 2016, the Welcome Ambassador Program, funded by the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration, emerged out of this context. We truly wanted to be able to provide the community with useful and accurate information as well as skills and tools to address racism and create, act, create welcoming communities and inclusive environments. That said, we felt that once uh, the ambassadors became ambassadors, they could be deployed, if you will, throughout the province, multiplying the efforts of ISANS, and so serving more people at, more, at one time. So who can participate as, in Welcome Ambassador? Well, anyone, really. Anyone who is interested in building the skills and knowledge to tackle the bar barriers of newcomer, uh, the barriers newcomers and refugees face in their community and workplace. So that could be private sponsors, volunteers, businesses, social services, truly anyone. It's open. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the process because there is a process that all participants must go through. There is an application screening process that they must go through. Then there is, uh, they must commit to time, the values of the program, and the fact that it is going to be action oriented. They must complete the four modules that are part of this program using adult education principles which means that all of the learnings are applied, experiential, and hands-on. At the end of the program, they must complete an action project, and they must get out into the community and do something. It's praxis, action, reflection. At the end of that, once they've proven what they've done, they will get a certificate saying that they have completed the program, and then they will have to do an evaluation. Now, at each point throughout the program, after every module, they will also have to do a, an evaluation. And at the end, they will have to do a much bigger evaluation of the entire program. So we always know how we are doing and how to improve the next section. So it's very hands-on and their voices are always very much heard in the process. So currently, we, pro we have approximately 175 former Welcome Ambassadors who are doing work in the community. So 
the Welcome Ambassador program looks like this. It's a 12 hour training program. It's organized into four sections and delivered over a four to six week time frame. And it uses a train the trainer model. And it equips all of the participants with knowledge, skills, and confidence necessary to develop and implement the Welcome Ambassador workshops within their social, professional, and volunteer networks. The one thing I love about this program is that it builds cultural awareness skills, it examines, and under, uh, examines the understanding of a person's own role in the systemic oppression, it develops skills and knowledge around power, privilege, privilege and allyship, it develops knowledge and awareness about refugee newcomers, and it, act, it allows participants to actively um, engage with Nova Scotians so they can help make Nova Scotia a more welcoming and inclusive uh, province. So as it breaks down here, you can see that there are the four modules. Module one looks at community building and understanding the situation of refugees. Module two looks at cultural humility and understanding new Nova Scotians. This is a really powerful one because here we have, we always invite a first voice guest speaker. So we get to hear live lived, lived experiences of a refugee and what they have had to go through to get here. And most often it is the first time that people have had an opportunity to hear a refugee story so close up, not through a screen or TV or that type of thing. It's very powerful. And uh, we usually have a lot of Kleenex on hand because it is that powerful. And speaking of power, module three looks at power and privilege and what that looks like. And then finally, in module four, we take a look at communication and we really help get our participants ready for their action plan and to, to let them go into the community. So the program started in 2016 and shortly after and later in 2016, um, there was an independent evaluation of the program that was conducted by several university professors from Dalhousie. They said that um, they found a few things. They said that the, the program accomplished more than the original objectives, which is great. The facilitation and hands-on exercises were important for the success of the program. The program created leadership for more for a more open and tolerant community. They also said that they actually gave us a few recommendations, five recommendations based on what they found. They said that the program should be repeated and made available to more community leaders. The program can be expanded to look at more diverse groups of refugees and newcomers. They also said that we ought to adjust the amount of and focus of information to tailor for diverse audiences. And ISENS should pursue opportunities to follow up and share information among alumni of the program. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later on, about what, something that we did this past summer. And ISANS should be encouraged to develop the program nationally for other cities and towns. So we have been doing this. We've been taking these recommendations very seriously, and we've been trying to grow the program from, from these recommendations. The next piece that I want to talk to you about is what I'm calling Pandemic Squared. So COVID happened in March. That was huge. And then that changed the way we delivered this program. We went from being completely in person where we could really grow as individuals and as a collective um, based on stories and having the aha moments and having that human touch amongst each other. And then COVID happened and we weren't able to do that. And then in May of 2020, George Floyd was tragically murdered, brutally murdered, and it was captured on film. So these two huge global pandemics and what came out of George Floyd's death was this international anti-racism movement. So COVID and this international movement collided with one another. And in physics, what happens in a collision is that there's an upsurge and then of energy and there's a space, a new space is created. 
So this is what's happened in this collision. A new space has been afforded us to be able to talk about these issues in a different and new way. So from this, our program has grown. So we've taken the Welcome Ambassador program and we have developed some new workshops that can be either standalone workshops or work in conjunction with our, um, with our Welcome Ambassador program. So the ones that we have already developed are Power and Privilege, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion or EDI 101, Microaggressions, Conscious and un Implicit Bias, the newcomer experience, and the one that I'm still working on is intergenerational trauma. So as I said, these can be uh, tailored from what they already are to a specific group. And these can either be online or in person, depending on where we are with COVID or what have you. So um, this is a very exciting new piece. Um, we've already run a few of them online um, and in person, and they have both been, it's been working in both ways. So it's really exciting to see how um, the program has been running. So in order for this program to work really well, you need a very skilled facilitator because we are talking, as I said earlier, what we were talking about, some of these bigger issues around power and privilege and microaggressions, EDI, uh, and conscious bias. These are all really complex and intersectional um, uh, workshops and uh, topics. And so you, uh, uh, your facilitator really must be very skilled in these areas to be able to talk about these complexities. This program works well in both rural and urban environments. It's easy to replicate. It's adaptable. It gives you hands-on practice because we talked about that hands-on experiential and applied pieces. Again, it's applied and it's very action-oriented. So it's got that praxis piece, so reflection and action. So it's very current because of what's happening. The program that started in 2016 doesn't look exactly the same as it does in 2020. So there have been changes and growth throughout. So some examples of what some of the people have been doing once they become ambassadors or on their road to becoming ambassadors, they've had coffee and chats, they've hosted discussion groups through with books or videos, they've had conversations and workshops, hosted brown bag lunches, they've become tutors, they've become volunteers, they've joined sponsorship groups, and they've had art and conversation groups. So there are many ways that people can be very creative. But the idea behind Welcome Ambassador really is to interrogate, interrupt, disrupt, question, critique, dismantle, deconstruct all of these huge colonial systems that are in place. And so what will happen from it is that people, the participants, the they become change agents. They get to a point where they say, where I ask them, okay, now you know something, what are you going to do about it? And what are you going to do about it? And what are you going to do about it? It speaks to accountability and responsibility. So everyone can be the change they want to see in the world to build a better, safer community through conversation and engagement. Thank you. So I'm going to be giving an overview of the Stronger Together project that we did last year. This was a short-term project that we did, uh, and it was around supporting marginalized youth, so newcomer racialized youth. I'll give an overview of the project along with the partners and the key activities, some examples from the social media campaign that the youth did, a snapshot of some of the best practices that we uh, that the youth developed uh, for the project. And I'll also give my contact information at the end. So if you do want the best practices manual, I can send it to you and also uh, show you how to get it on our website. And it's available in French and English. So a brief overview of the project. So this was um, funded by Canadian Heritage, and it was an anti-racist project that was supporting uh, those racialized newcomer youth about how to take action and deal with racism and discrimination that, that they faced. So it was youth-centered and it was partnership-based. And we also used arts-based programming to help talk about uh, these heavy topics and these sensitive topics. 
And one of the deliverables was that we were to share our learnings with others. So that's where the best practices manual came in. So the actions that we took and the processes and the learnings that we had throughout the project, uh, that's uh, what we created the best practices manual with. So in terms of partners, we wanted to have the project be open to as many youth as possible. So we had three main partners in addition to ISANS. They were YMCA Center for Immigrant Programs, African Disapora Association of the Maritimes, or ADAM, Immigration Francophone de Nouvelle Ecosse, IFNI, and these partners were involved from the very beginning. So they were involved with the interview uh, committee where we hired the project coordinator and the facilitator. We had um, sessions with them that were facilitated by an external facilitator where we went over uh, the project. We shared the proposal, the budget, the work plan. We talked about the expectations for the project or approach to the project. And then we also continued uh, to provide updates uh, to everyone, uh, the project coordinator and the facilitator. We had biweekly meetings where the program staff met with all four partners and provided uh, updates and input and then the partners were able to provide input as well as feedback on next steps. Also all the partners were involved with the project from the very beginning because they also recommended youth to participate in the project. So youth uh, were had a connection with at least one of these partners and they had a relationship with someone who was involved with the project because each of the partners also helped with facilitating and organizing activities throughout the project. And we had the meetings every two weeks with the management committee and we also had regular meetings with the program staff who were working directly with the youth. So some of the key activities that we did with the youth there were weekly sessions, and again, these were using the arts-based activities that were hands-on and scenario-based. And these were used to discuss anti-racism, power and privilege, as well as action strategies. We also uh, did events out in the community. Uh, so they, the youth went to uh, an art exhibit on Black contemporary, Black and Canadian contemporary art. They also went to see a play on Viola Desmond called Controlled Damage. There were also workshops that we did in partnership with others on systemic oppression, intersectionality, intersectionality and hip hop. So for example, we did a workshop in partnership with the McPhee Center, which is an arts-based nonprofit organization. And they helped the youth participants to develop illustrations of their own version of what superheroes with intersectional identities looked like. And then these were used to have a larger discussion about these traits. We also uh, used forum theater. So I'll, again, this was in partnership with a community organization where these facilitators use drama as a form of expression to explore the lived experiences of the youth participants when facing racism and discrimination. We also did a photo voice project and a social media campaign, and I'll show you some examples from that. Uh, and then we also held a public event at the ha Halifax Public Library that was in partnership with other community organizations in addition to the three main partners. And this was an opportunity for the youth to showcase social justice pieces through theater, dance, poetry, and illustrations. And there was also a panel discussion with the youth and other young local activists on what identity and racism and discrimination looks like in Canada. So the social media campaign. This used a uh, photo voice. So this was where the youth took photos of images that were meaningful to them and then added a writing to go along with the photo. So this photo was taken by one of the youth participants. It's of Spring Garden Road in downtown Halifax. And the quote that they added to this photo was, move outside, volunteer and socialize with other people when you are a newcomer in Canada. You will meet new friends and activities to keep you focused because the more you isolate this yourself, the more you get culture shock and feel lost. Another photo. And the quote from the youth participant was this. The Canadian maple leaf. It's part of the flag, falling leaves, changing color, maple syrup. Today, the maple leaf is a recognized symbol of Canada. 
It also has come to symbolize unity, tolerance, and peace. The Syrian olive tree leaf is season of harvest, olive oil, food, make a profit, opportunity, production, farming, supports families, beauty, firewood. Syrian leaf can be found globally wherever you go. And the final photo that I'll share with you and the quote that was included with this. Obviously you could say that it is a wreath, but what if it is just a flower? It could be significant in a number of ways. It could symbolize a season, bravery, peace, victory, growth, everlasting life and eternity for it is circular and has a beginning and end. Just as you have numbered a lot of ideas on the use of a wreath, the same labels I have also received. I have been labeled a lot of things because of my race. I have been described as poor because of where I come from. I have been called uneducated, stupid, not smart because of my accent. I have been called all these things because of all of the stereotypes that are running in the backs of minds right now. You have been taught to say all these things along with what you call yourself. It is just a label. So a question, who would you be if the world never gave you a label? So stop labeling because who you are is found on the inside. So some of the best practices or recommendations that we gathered throughout this project was that it was really important to create meaningful interactions and trusting relationships with the participants. As you can see from the previous quotes and photo voice, there are some heavy topics and discussions and emotions and backgrounds that are talked about. So it's important that the staff who are involved in these uh, youth-centered projects are relatable to the youth. It might be through shared experiences and backgrounds, race, culture, age, gender. There's lots of different ways. And it's important to acknowledge the power and uh, privilege dynamic between youth and staff, no matter who the staff are. It's also important to interact with all the youth participants. So making sure that you're not just uh, interacting with the ones that you know or the ones that you can more easily relate to. And pay attention when the youth are talking with you. Don't multitask, use eye contact. Let them know that you are paying attention by your actions. It's also really important to the youth that you learn the correct pronunciations of their names and re remember the details of the information that they have shared with you. And also share relevant information with them. Budgets, outcomes, processes, activities, plans. This all helps to create a trusting and environment and transparency. As noted before, we used arts-based programming, and this helped to create that non-judgmental space to discuss difficult topics. It helped to overcome language barriers, and it also helped to develop creative skill sets. And with a youth-centered approach, it's important to have that from the beginning of the project and throughout the project. So find out the creative talents of the youth, find out what they're interested in, get their impact, input on what they want to do, get their feedback on how things are going. Compensate youth for their involvement as well. This can be through developing their skills, connecting them with experts in the community, as well as monetary honorariums. Use social media to communicate with the youth. We used a lot of Instagram and Snapchat to provide information about workshops and sessions, to provide them reminders, to give them directions to venues of how to get to those community events. And partner with other groups uh, in the community so that youth can get more involved in their community in the long term. So this place-based services. This way youth can get to meet staff at other organizations, get involved in their programming, know where they are and how to get to their venues. So these connections are created and made so that youth can continue with these connections after the project ends. So there is a best uh, practices manual. Uh, I can share that with you and my email is here. It is available in English and French. It's also available on our website. So if you go to isans.ca, if you go to the homepage, if you go to the stay informed tab on the top right hand side, 
and then click on publications on the lower left. Just scroll down and you'll find it under the tools and resources section. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Maria. So we will now move into questions. We have um, several questions on Slido. I don't know if we'll be able to cover them all, but I will try to um, uh, pick out the questions with the most uh, interest and try to pick out questions for each of the presentations. So we'll start with the questions uh, in response to Venka's presentation. Venka, um, one of the uh, people in the workshop wants to know how many black staff specifically do you currently have in positions like manager and above? Currently, we, we do not. Uh, we have had in the past and we, uh, we are actively uh, looking to make sure, you know, to try to have representation in the leadership team. So we continue and I hope in the near future we will have. And there's another question for you as well, which is, is there any specific change in ISAN's EDI strategies in response to the Black Lives Matter movement or to address anti-Black racism? We, um, so, um, so what we, with the uh, EDI um, strategy, we have been working on an EDI statement and we uh, have also been looking at, uh, uh, we have been working, uh, we, we, we developed uh, one related to uh, anti-racism, uh, anti-black racism as well, to try to, and, and looking at how we uh, can specifically um, support um, uh, this, this part of our community and, in, and the larger black community in Nova Scotia. The, um, uh, the other thing we did is that we reached, uh, we, partic we, we saw that particularly our racialized staff and our racialized clients were, uh, were, were very, um, very uh, traumatized by the situation that had been happening. And, and so we, we, what we did with, with staff, we offered um, uh, support like uh, uh, groups where we had external facilitators to, uh, to support staff and participate and we focused on so we had one for racialized staff and one uh, for other uh, staff that are not identifying as racialized and also we saw uh, we also responded to um, needs by by uh, clients particularly parents about how are we speaking to our, uh, our our children about what's happening and so that was another area um, that we were dealing with. Another thing related to our what we have done over the last little while, and with the pandemic, things have been a little bit sidetracked. The other thing we have done is that um, there has been uh, partners in the community that have been um, that we have been partnering with in the past that also um, that, that we together went together and and put in proposals related to. Um, to uh, yeah, black anti-racism. So we are hoping with their, you know, that, that we can be um, part of their project. So we can then over time uh, do some, some additional work, work in, uh, in that area. So that is where we have, but in terms of the strategy, uh, we have had a lot of discussions about where it needs to be fitting in. And um, so there, there's more to do, to do around that. I hope I answered the, the questions. And one um, final one I'll, I'll direct to you, Venka. Um, how do you plan to engage in the work of anti-racism, anti-oppression in a way that does not include assigning all the work to an EDI role? Um, so really what we are seeing in the organization that everything we touches is a piece of EDI. So it, it's not, uh, not the role of only the coordinators that does the the presentations like what we had had an introduction to today that everything that we do at every level and at and every part of programming or services uh, that we all need to be on the same page and we are par every everybody is part of it um, and also to make sure that everybody is supported in the roles that they are having um, so that's why I went, when our earlier we're talking about that we are doing and we are trying to make an approach and, and um, a strategy that, that covers everybody. So that is from, um, from, um, from, from leadership positions to, um, 
the, the uh, English as a second language instructors to um, the coordinators that are doing, you know, you know, what, you know, you know welcoming communities, and, but it's also the receptionist and the other. So it's really all of our job and we need to figure out how we, so our process has been about how do we make sure that we have an organization that see, see themselves in all of this and, and that we all take a part in it. Thank you. Uh, Paul, um, a question that says, the employer culture path endpoint mentions recognition. Can you share any types of recognition for employers, internal or external public? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but part of the pathway is helping employers to uh, recognize what they've been doing, what their staff are able to do, what their management have been doing, uh, and the impact that their actions have on not not only everybody internally but externally as well. So, part, so part, the intention of the program is to help employers um, become much better able to recognize internal and external success. Uh, I if that's the nature of the question. Uh, as far as what this program does to recognize employers, um, at the moment, there are just a few things moving that, that are ideas really uh, looking for uh, a sufficient number of employers uh, to, to look at some um, areas of best practice for sharing and uh, get, more, get more formal about that. Uh, as, as far as a, a community of, of, of best practice. Uh, at the moment we do, we have certificates and things to say you've attended, you've participated, you've, you've had uh, good contributions in certain parts of the program, uh, but there's a wider, uh, a, a wider aspiration in the, in the, com in the coming, coming years to say, how do we, how do we help uh, create that, that community of employers who are actually uh, ahead, ahead of the curve and, uh, and doing very, very worthwhile um, practices that, that should be shared more widely. Thank you. Um, Sherry, a question for you. How different are welcome ambassadors and volunteers? Why isn't it called a volunteer program? Um, it, is welcome ambassador not included actual action? I'm not sure I understand stand exactly. Um, is there no need for a criminal record check? Great questions. So the Welcome Ambassador program is a train the trainer program for adults and their action pieces are for specifically for other adults. So that's probably one of the reasons why, probably the reason why we've never had a, a criminal record check needed because nobody's working with uh, children or, or youths. Um, and this is an education program. Um, so, you know, volunteers can certainly take this, but anyone can take it. So it's more than just a volunteer program. It's an action-oriented piece once you get your piece of paper from having uh, gone through the learnings. And, um, and it's free. And maybe... If I may add something here, sure. Some some people take those learnings into their work. It's not just as a volunteer role. Some people change the way they do work in their, for example, in their community organization based on this training, or train their colleagues in their workplace. Yes, and a really good example of that, Nabiha, if I could, if I may, is um, no. In Halifax, we have a wonderful um, sailing ambassador called. Theodore Tugboat. It used to be um, a program on PBS, but they built a real life big model of it and it's on the Halifax waterfront and it's part of the Halifax Museum of the Atlantic. And so the people in, the, um, in that museum took the program, the Welcome Ambassador program, and then they decided to actually make Theodore Tugboat an ambassador. So people could come on board and then actually learn about, do the program on board Theodore Tugboat. So it was an interesting way of using what Halifax has um, to host a in a different way. 
So I really liked that. But um, yes, anyone can do this. And it can be done as a volunteer. You could take this into your workplaces. It can do, you can take it into your volunteer organizations. Anywhere that you think this can be replicated, it can be. It's that easy. Thank you. It looks like we have time maybe for one or two more questions. And again, most of them uh, apply to Venka's presentation. Um, so Venka, uh, there's a question here that says, how do you manage varying levels of compliance with EDI hiring practices for different managers in the organization? How is success measured? Um, that is actually um, some of the more of the work that we are still working on, but we also have been uh, through our people and culture uh, team or the um, the associate director there have worked on uh, looking at you know standardizing the way that we are doing it uh, to make sure that and, and providing training for the managers around it and support to make sure that you know the questions that we are providing the way the interviews are done so so we have look, started to look at that or look, look at it more and um, and there's always uh, someone from uh, the people and culture part of those interviews as well. So again, to try to do the to do the making sure that we are uh, we are following the same um, uh, way, and 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 make trying to to make sure there is uh, you know no bias in that in terms of inter, you know doing that process. Thank you. And one last question for Paul. How are you talking to employers and staff about anti-Black racism specifically? Oh, that's a good question. Um, really, in coming in saying this is this is um, something that's been going on for a long time. It's raised uh, its profile. It's essential to have these conversations uh, and to say that somebody who walks through the world with with white privilege has a responsibility to bring this topic up. Uh, and uh, I find that when I bring it up, people are uncomfortable, uh, there's pushback, uh, and at the same time, there's often a relief and there's often um, a massive uh, response by especially white senior management saying, I've got a question, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to start. And I find I can, uh, I can signpost to a variety of other resources and other people uh, but the person with white privilege saying this is essential to talk about uh, is actually an amazing step into that territory. Uh, and if you consider that the majority of immigrants are racialized, if you look at who's coming in from around the world, uh, Europe is a minority of the world. And when we look at who's coming in from other parts of the world, uh, most of the folks coming in uh, are darker and or have different skin skin tones and and this is a reality that we all have and we need to acknowledge that uh, we have to we've got to we've got to engage with this in a very very real way so that's, that's kind of how I bring it in. <laughs> 